is obviously to pray for Paris. Um, you know, that, that hit, hit everybody. One of the French newspapers in 9-11 in had said that, uh, you know, we're all Americans. That was a big headline when we got hit in 9-11. And then on Facebook, people's posting in response to that, we're all French. And, I, and, and you know, um, the, the attacks have to be addressed because one thing about it is, is that um, there's a lot of questions why. I mean, you can imagine people asking why and people don't understand, but there's one thing that unites us for human beings, okay? No matter what culture, what you look like, what you dress, we're all human beings. And when one of us dies, it touches us all. And <clears throat> one thing I was thinking about, and Lee and I, she's, I call her angel, so she, she's my angel, but she's got so much insight about if you knew that was going to happen, how would you treat the others around you? If you knew, if you knew that was going to be your last day with that person, would you argue with them? Nope. Would you hug them a little longer? Yeah. Would you call them and tell them you love them? That's why God wants us to do that when he puts it on our heart. Yeah. Call them and say, you know, hey, I love you. Or give them a little hug. My mom, God bless her, I, I just, I think about her a lot. One thing she used to do, and I, and I don't know, I just, I was kind of a little tougher exterior. You know, I've been truck driver for years. You got to kind of develop that. But I hadn't been home in a while, and she was hanging clothes up. And I probably shared this before, but she, we had a clothesline up, up by, we had a picnic table in the front. And she saw my van drive up. And, and she, you know, at that time, she'd been in her 70s. And she was hanging clothes on the line. And she saw me, and I get out of the van. And here's come this old lady comes running at me. You know, she comes running at me like this with her arms wide open. Oh, my son, I love him, I love him, and her arms just wide open. You know, I didn't, I didn't quite get why people run like this, you know, because they have nothing to hide. Yeah. Their love is so big for you, and they just want to grab you and hold you. And, man, she held me so tight. You know, Mama, thank you, kind of let go a little bit, you know. <laughs> you know, that woman just squeeze you. Why? Because she loves you. That's right. And that's what we have to let the people know that we love them. As we're with the French, um, the, the people, the, all that tragedy, and, and there's going to be a lot of questions. But in my own life, when I had those questions, one scripture God led me to was Psalm 56. And this is really has been something that got me through all these things that, that have happened. And Psalm 56, so I'm going to read a few verses in here. I'm going to start with Psalm 56, 3. What time I'm afraid, I will have confidence in you. I put my trust and reliance in you. By the help of God, I will praise his word. On God, I lean, rely, and confidently put my trust. I will not fear. What can man who is flesh do to me? All day long, they twist my words and trouble my affairs. All their thoughts are against me for evil and my hurt. They gather themselves together. They hide themselves. They watch my steps, even as they have expectantly waited for my life. They think to escape with iniquity, and shall they, in your indignation, bring down the peoples, O God? You, you number, I love this, you number and record my wanderings. Put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then shall my enemies turn back in the day that I cry out, this I know. For God is for me. That's what it is. Amen. God be for you. Who can be against you? Amen. All the stuff that has happened, long as I know God is with me, I can make it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where all the questions, all the things that you got to get that deep down in your heart. Yeah. In God, this verse 10, whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I, in God have I put my trust and confident reliance. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Your vows are upon me, O God. I will render praise to you and give you thank offerings. 
For you have delivered my life from death, yes, and my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of light and the land of the living. I want us to always remember that this morning as we think about what has happened and realize that no matter what happens in our life, God is still God. Yes, Friday night, when we was having prayer, one of the things that was going through me is no matter what happens, God would just put, no, no matter what happens, you walk with God. Uh, no matter what happens in your life, walk with God. Right. Stay on. You know, a derail train gets nowhere, right? It's got to, they got to lift it up. I've seen derail trains do, do my career, and, and, and they got to, sometimes they got to work on the track, but they got to get that train back on the rail so it'll keep running. That's right. And sometimes that's what we look at our lives, and sometimes they get derailed. Get back on the track and keep running. Amen. Even when it hurts, you keep running. Mm -hmm. You know, I always like, you know, they, they had a, a, a picture of an officer that uh, they was doing a half marathon, and the guy fell on his face to play, and the officer went over and pick them up and help them cross the finish line. That's what it's about. It's about helping one another and believing one another. Because we never know what people are going through in their life. We don't know that. And sometimes all they need is a kind word. All they need is encouragement. All they need is somebody who says, you know, I'm standing with you, brother. I'm standing with you. Because I'm telling you what, there may be people in their life just getting ready to quit. Just getting ready to say, I'm, I, I can't take this anymore. But you know what? When somebody says you're praying, that is powerful. Yeah. Now, when, when you pray, when you say you're going to pray for somebody, pray for somebody. Right. You know, I, that's why I, I, I have a lot of notes, notebooks and stuff, and I'll write it down. I'll write notes. Uh, for years in my truck, I had a little, little notebook and a prayer book, and I'd go out the gate when I worked for Walmart, and some of the guards would say, would you pray for me or something? And I'd write it down right there. Yeah. Why? Because when they come back, Tim, did you pray for me? Sure did. If you just tell them, you might forget in, right. in, you know, two or three hours or two or three days. Did you pray for me? Uh, what was it? <laughs> what was I supposed to pray for you about? But when I write it down, there's something about having it written down and saying, yeah, brother, pray for it. And one thing I do on Facebook a lot, when there's prayer requests, I just write these two words, prayers up. That's what I'm going to write, prayers up. You know why? Because we're sitting those prayers up. And I'm telling you, we're not believing the prayers are just going to stop the ceiling. Well, that's kind of a waste of time if they just go here, okay? We're sending them all the way up to the throne. Amen. One thing I really love, when, when, when Jesus went to the cross and, and, and then when the, when the veil got split, when it ripped, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit we could go in there, yeah. okay? We didn't, have to, we didn't have to have the sacrifice of the high priest. We could go in ourselves because yeah. Jesus was our sacrifice. Yeah. He's our high priest. We can go yeah. in there. We can go right in there with yeah. that boldness. Can you imagine that? Somebody was talking about that on the radio. He said, like, you know, if, if, if we're going to go see President Obama, we can't just walk in the White House. You can't just walk in there. I just want to, there's a lot to go through to go see President Obama. And he's the president. He's a man. Yeah. Uh -huh. But can you imagine a creator, God, yeah. of the universe that started this all off? You can go right up to him. That's what I love about God. Yeah. You know, when I'm hurting and crying, <clears throat> I can go right to him. And it don't matter what time of day or night. Amen. See, some people you can't do They say, call me anytime. They ain't going to work. Yeah. <laughs> they ain't going to work. Call them at 3 o'clock in the morning. See what they say. Call them at 4 o'clock. What are you doing? Call me, brother. Yeah. <laughs> you said call me anytime. Not this time. You know, I go to bed at 8 o'clock. Yeah. I'm going to finish watching Green Acres. Then you can call me. <laughs> you know? Watch that. You know, but no, I, I mean, you know what? People have time. They have a time, but God, you're not disturbing him. Amen. That's what I love. I got. I got to share this. One thing I love is when is when uh, uh, Jesus was sleeping in the boat. You know, it's down there sleeping, and these waves start coming. And them guys are fishermen, so they understood what storms. But they had to know that this storm was different. Right. Say so otherwise, they wouldn't be scared, you know, because something was different about this storm. And you know what? They said, you know, Jesus is down there sleeping. What kind of deal is that? You know, he's down there sleeping. You know, somebody needs to go wake him up because we're going to go off this boat. We're going to die. <laughs> and you know, you know they had to let Peter because Peter had a big mouth, you know. So, so Peter, go wake him up. Somebody needs to go wake Jesus. Do you honestly think they went down? Hey, Jesus, please wake up. We need No, it wasn't. when you heard, hey, Jesus, we need your help up here. Please get up. 
And you know what? Jesus wasn't irritated. I love that. You know, if you wake some people up, yeah. they, they get pretty irritated as you woke them up. Man, some language comes out. might not be proper when it comes time to wake them up. Yeah. I'm being honest, you know. You broke bother me. Why you bother me, you know? But only thing Jesus was saying, hey, you know, don't you have faith? Yeah. He didn't get mad at him. You know, don't you have faith? Man, if y'all have faith, y'all can stop this storm. And isn't it amazing? Peace be still. Yeah. Peace be. And then look, whoa, man. Mm -hmm. Hey, this is serious stuff. <laughs> hey, we joined the right team. That's right. <laughs> We on the right team. We on God. So anybody can stop the storm like that? Man, this must be who he is. And later on, you know, Jesus asked, who the men say that I am? You know, some, some Elias or somebody. He said, no, you know what? You know what Peter said? We know you're the son of God. You're the one. And that's what we got to always have in our heart, that we know who we have believed. That's what Paul said. One of Paul's chief things, that I may know him. There's something about knowing God that gets deep in your heart. So all these things don't bother you. There's still things that go on in your life. But I'm telling you, when Jesus did ahead of your life, things are so much. You get that peace. It doesn't matter what's going on. You know that Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. Bring it on. You know why? Because Jesus Christ is still going to be Lord. He's still going to walk through the tornadoes with you. You know, he's still going to be there with you. He's still going to love you. He's still going to put our arms around you. He yep. says, you know what? This is my child, and I'm going to take care of it. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. We're going to open this up for praise and prayer requests. Because that's what you do at church. Praise and prayer requests. Hallelujah. So important, those two together. Because you praise God for answering those prayers. Amen. You know, and, and you can send those requests. Just keep sending them. You can't, you can't pray too many times. You can't send too many requests up to God because he's going to answer them. He sends that. He sends that. And the thing about love about God, the way he answers prayers, he answers them in so many different ways you won't even expect. That's right, William. Absolutely. Come out of nowhere. Well, I didn't expect that. All I can say, that's God. That's right. That's all I can say, that's God. So someone like to start, yes. stop raining. His kingdom has no end. Right. right? And that's what we always got to believe when all this stuff happens. I always tell people when a lot of stuff happens in your life, God's getting ready to bless you. That's what I tell them. When things just seem like they're in turmoil, God's still there. That's right. He, he can calm that storm. Amen. And, and, and you know, when God does certain things, and I know I said it before, but it's absolutely true, you know it's him. Yep. You can't say it's him. Well, it's just coincidence, Tim. I said, no. I don't believe in God that has coincidences. I believe in God that blesses you. That's what I believe in. That's what I believe in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, someone else. Yes.
Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. And that and that's a Yeah, that was a that was a a day, you know, you drive I've driven semi for years and years and I've had my trailer lifted off the ground and I and it's it talk about a hopeless feeling. I mean you just like you know, you know you can't do anything. Just ride it out, you know. And I've had that and they, they end up calling our trucks in. Our trucks was out in the road that day and they could make the call to bring them in because we, we do have students and but you know, I was glad when all the trucks get in safe. But yeah, you watch watch those things and, and all the years you just you know, I, I was always so thankful when I got back to the yard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, when I when I saw that gate and you went to the gate and you got back in the yard, it was is a sense of relief yeah. that you made another trip because mm-hmm. things change. You're right. A lot of trucks got blown over um, that day, and you know, lives can be changed forever and ever on a day like that. Mm-hmm. But you know, I, I just have to keep believing God's still God. Yeah. No matter no matter what happens, we got That's something we can never ever forget. No matter what we're going through, I, I can't stress that enough. Because what tends to happen when mm-hmm. things are going really, really bad, you know, that's what we tend to we tend to do a lot of questioning God, but we we get driven to our knees a lot. Yeah. But during that time, we're driven to our knees because things are bad. Don't forget how God delivers you out of that. Because right. sometimes when things get yeah. good and the money's good and everything, God kind of gets kind of pushed out. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't quite need, you know, my cupboards are full and. My bank account, you know, I checked my ATM machine, and I actually has a comma in there, you know, 1,000, had a comma, you know, but it's got a comma, I'm good, you know, yes, I got a little money in the bank, but sometimes you can get away, but no, that's the time to still pray, you're thankful, we was talking about that coming to, coming to church, how, how we need to thank God every day. I mean, it's, you know, if, you, if you're grateful, it's just like God bless you more and more and more when you're grateful and take time to thank him. You know, but when you don't acknowledge what God has done, man, I mean, it can all be gone in one second. You know, you, you thumb your nose up at God, and I see people do it. You know, sometimes as a Christian, when somebody says something, you got to respond. I mean, sometimes, I, you know, you, you, when, when you get wisdom, that's what wisdom, wisdom is, no one to shut this and no, no one to speak. Sometimes you got to, and it's hard, it's hard. Control that tongue, Jane, talk about it. You know, because, boy, it can generate a lot, but you got to know. But sometimes it's so fired up in you, yeah. you got to say something. Because you're defending the creator. You're defending God. And one day I had an individual, and he was talking about his grandmother. I'll never forget that. You know, and he, he wasn't, he really didn't believe in God and stuff. But he said, you know, Tim, I think my grandma, she, she raised me, she believes in God too much. Buddy, I had to say something. Woo-hoo! Oh, buddy, I had to say something. You talk about lighting the dynamite off, buddy. I'm going. I said I had. I said you can never believe in God too much. How are you gonna do that? Yeah. He's a God that loves you so much. You know, God that cares about you. Before you was in your mama's womb, knit womb, He knew you. He's knitting together your personality. If it wasn't for God putting breath in your lungs, you wouldn't even breathe that next morning. You wouldn't be alive. The one that opened your eyes every morning, your your heart's beating every morning. Who do you think does that? Who puts blood going through? Who does that? Yeah. Who gives you kids and grandkids and, yeah. and jobs and, and home? Who, who gives all that to you? That just happened to drop out of the sky? Yeah. I should I should have contained myself. <laughs> but I could. I, I, I was fired up then. Because you know what? I'm going to defend God. Yes. I can't help but defend him because I know where he brought me from. Amen. I know that. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Someone, yes. When I was getting ready to have hip surgery here, I can't remember the exact date, but let's keep her in prayer that she goes through this with mm-hmm. her age and anesthesia is not always mm-hmm. an easy thing to get through. Um, just thanking the Lord for our family last week and our get together, and you know, God's always got His hand on the way back home. Um, um, Hugh, who's nine years old, swallowed a whole entire gallon later. Uh-huh. And my daughter had to unbuckle him and do the hemlock on him because the whole plane was freaking out. Thank God she knew what to do. And the whole thing came up <laughs> whole. But what do you do when you're in the air? I mean, you're in the air. You can't yeah. just run to a hospital or anywhere else. So thank the Lord that everything in that situation turned out, you know, fine. Um, God's got his hand upon our kids, even when we can't. And yep. um, right. our daughter, Tracy, is expecting and um, 
she's just been really, really sick this whole time. We really never thought she could have kids, but the man she has was a Marine. He's considerably older than her. Just the most respectful man you, that you want to have or be part of your family. He just goes like family. So John asked him on Thanksgiving if he would pray. And it's just good to have our kids aren't really serving the Lord like we'd like them to, but to have somebody there that, I mean, he does. He just, he'll talk about the Lord. And uh, Tracy says, Mom, I felt really bad the other day. And, and I says, Michael, will you pray for me? And she says, Mom, he put his phone down. He turned the TV off. It was just like, yeah, this is serious. We're going to pray. So I thank the Lord that he's brought thank somebody you. into her life, you know. Yeah, I don't know where it's leading to, but at least he's a man of faith and a man of God. He says, you know, you have to be when you're out there, you know, in the Marines and things happen and you see things and uh, you got to be a God. <laughs> Amen. So, you know, I thank the Lord that he's, that he's working situations out in our family and, and bringing some godly people in. The other boys just kind of, you know, John would never ask them probably to pray, but <laughs> Michael gladly prayed. We hadn't really talked to him that much about God, but just something about his spirit. It's just, you can tell that, you know, and with that, his mother, uh, they, last Sunday, two Sundays ago, she just developed a couple knots in her neck, and they don't know what's going on. They winded up doing surgery. We still don't really have a report, but if we could pray for Victoria, his mother, and whatever's going on in her body, that the Lord would just dissolve and totally heal her and restore her to health. Appreciate it. Amen. Yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that. Someone else? Yes. Yeah, um, just thank the Lord for his everlasting love. It's just so enormous and overwhelming. Uh, like you were saying, you know, when, uh, when they go through the storms, they go out there, they go out into the world, and stuff happens, you know, and stuff comes up. And, and like you were saying, when you come back from uh, being out there, you know, in the truck, the ease of safety, <laughs> God's love it is, is overwhelming. We used to sing that song, God is an awesome God, and, that, and that's absolutely true. When you think about <clears throat> what God has done for you, what he's going to do for you, all the blessings he, you, he's given you. I mean, I, I mean, just, just you know, one day I uh, had a, uh, I was doing a church service, and it, it, it always, you know, I always like to do illustrations that people would never, ever forget. But I did it with toilet paper one day. I took I took a roll, and it took me two hours. And on each little ply, I wrote one blessing of God. I wrote, and it took me about two hours. Boy, I was stretching it after that. Yeah. You know, it was right thumb, left thumb, big toe, little toe. You know? I was stretching, and then I had the church. People in church get up, and I stretched that clear around the church. Uh -huh. And I said, each one of those a blessing. You know, and, and people looked at it, never forgot it. Man, I said, well, if I use a double roll, I could keep going around and keep going around and around and around. But, but it, what it was designed for, think about how many blessings God gives you in one. Just count them. Somebody said you ought to count your blessings more than you do your sorrows. I mean, they're overwhelming. If you put them on a scale, you know which one's going to balance out. All the blessings. You know, all the blessings. You're going to have so many blessings, you know. And, and God does it. I just, I just feel like uh, I, I have felt it this year. That that's where God wants us to be, is to start counting our blessings, start praising Him, yeah. start thanking yeah. Him, you know, for all that He's done for us. Because I think that's where it takes you in a new realm. 
It takes you into something powerful. You know, Isaiah, you know, when he, when he, when he saw the Lord lifted up in his train filled with you're so overwhelmed yeah. mm -hmm. with that. You're overwhelmed with God's goodness. See his holiness. It's just, it's, it's just amazing that when you get in that realm, and I've always, and I've said this before, that's the only image I've ever seen of God was that. When I, when I see God, I see him high lifted up on his throne. I never see him running up there, him and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. They're running around trying to figure out what they're going to do down here. I never get that image, not one time. I get it. We got this. You know, you took in, 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 in modern, modern terms, I got this. I wish you would believe. And that's where Jesus, or sometimes Jesus says, I just wish they would believe me. You know, it's like, it's almost like a little, little, for, I wish they just would believe. Hey, you know, that's all I asked for. That's why Gabriel, when Gabriel came down and delivered the message, you know, that, that uh, Zachariah, you know, well, how am I supposed to know this? How am I supposed to know it? Let, brother, let me tell you, I'm from the throne of God. And he sent me to deliver this message to you. That's how you ought to know it. But since you don't believe me, I'm going to make you done until John comes along. That's what's going to happen. And it's all. Oh, and, and Mary, if you look at Mary, the way Mary, you know, Mary had never been with anybody. She was going to have yeah. Jesus. And yeah. how am I, wait, 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 there's one thing. Mm -hmm. I haven't even been with a man yet. Yes. But you know what? She believed. There was something about Mary's spirit that just loved. You know, she didn't understand everything. You know, when, when Jesus was born, he came back, and, and, they, and they, uh, they were saying things in the temple. They had him dedicated, a lot of things. She didn't understand all, all this stuff that was going to happen. She just had a heart to just believe. Yeah. You know, and Joseph, Joseph, I know he doesn't get much, you know, there's things written about him. But Joseph... Was, he, he was just such a man that followed God. He didn't understand everything. God spoke to him a dream. He said, hey, you know, uh, well, there's a lot going on here. Am I supposed to take Mary and she's going to have a baby from someone else going to be the king of kings, Lord of Lord? Man, this is a lot of stuff going on. Uh -huh. You know, he was going to think, well, maybe it's best I just kind of put her away and, you know, try to make things. But he listened to what God came and spoke to him a dream. Take her as your wife. Take yes. her. Yes. Don't worry. It, it'll all work out. And that's, that's really what's going to happen. And I think that really, that's where when God speaks to us in that still, small voice, listen to what God has to say. Amen. Because God's always running ahead like the grand chess master. He's always running ahead. That's what God is doing. You know, and in your life, we, we don't understand. God will put a thought in your mind or have a prayer request. It's important, so important to be obedient to what God is saying to you. It may not make sense at the time. Let me tell you, i got, I got to share this and. But I, I drove a truck for years, and I was actually coming through Des Moines. And, you know, I've learned because I've made mistakes. Sometimes I didn't listen quite as good as I should have. But the next time, I guarantee I get it. Yeah, so yeah. I, I'm, I'm coming through Des Moines, and they had tornado warnings out up here. So I'm coming, and I'm coming around 80. And it was clear, Lord, Lord speaking my heart, Tim, when you get where 80 and 35 split and 80 goes west, at first rest there, pull in. The storm's coming. Just pull in. <coughs> So you could see the dark clouds, and uh, you know how it gets still before the storm, and that's what happened. I come around there, and they had all these warnings on the radio, and I come around, and I went west on 80, and it was perfectly calm. Oh, Absolutely perfectly <laughs> calm. I'm thinking, well, maybe, maybe we missed it, you know. <laughs> maybe we missed it. So I, I see the rest there, right? And I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe it's all over now. And as soon as I went past the rest, I wouldn't eat. Uh, I mean, as soon as I went past the rest there, here comes that wind, and it about flipped me over. So you know what Tim learned the next time? You know what I learned the next time? Buddy, we're pulling the rest area. If God says pulling the rest area, okay? That never happened again because I learned. I, I never had a problem with, you know, when people make mistakes, you know, people say this and this. It's not a problem. We make mistakes if you learn from it. You know, God God understands we're human beings. We, we don't always listen the way we should and do the things we should. I mean, you don't throw your kids out once they screw up one time. Right. You, don't, you don't do that if the room is dirty. Yes. Excuse me. Yes. I have something to say to that. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Can I, for one minute? Oh, yes, ma'am. I have no business except no. this is God's house. Yes, ma'am. And I came here. Yes, ma'am. Because I need to get it so bad. Let me tell you about kids. Yes. Oh, sorry. A few months ago, by oh. his brother. Oh. Now, I came here today, and I don't know why I'm here. Yes. But I'm listening to you. 
Yes, ma'am. Glory to God. He brought me here. Yes, ma'am. Whatever reason. Jesus. I'm here. Yes, ma'am. Jesus. And I praise God every day. Yes. Yes. I didn't lose one son. I lost two. Oh. In the same second. Oh. And never. Man. Yes. Yes. Everybody thinks I should have just turned my back on my other son. And the big guy, Barry, his brother, stabbed him to death right out here. I had to cross his blood in the street every day for a week until he cleans it up. Jesus. You know. That's right. He loves you. He loves you, man. So, okay. And your sons. That's true. Uh, Ma'am, if it be all right, can we pray? For, what, what's your... Uh,
For everybody, thank you for being here. And Angie, if you can be patient. I believe what the Lord has given me is specifically for you. It's for all of us. But I, I do believe that the Lord wants to speak to you in particular. He wants you to know how much he loves you, how much he loves your son, how much he loves all of us. Let's go to Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Everybody just continue to pray. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. See, you can find the King James just for that. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we're, we're in grace. We're in a position of acceptance by God because of God. Not because of us, not because of what we've done, good or evil, right or wrong, but simply because God is love, because God loves us. Amen? Especially you. God's love is always, always at its most tangible, most experiential, uh, transformative when we are at our lowest. Grace is like water, it's like a river. It, 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 it flows to the lowest place. And God's grace is flowing to you right now, Angie, even as low as you may feel, as bad as you feel, as much of a failure as you might feel. This, this love of God, this grace, comes from outside of us. We, we can't love ourselves, Angie. We can't love ourselves like this, at least not in the middle of real failure. We know we fail. We know we fail. We, we want to take responsibility, and that's, that's fine. But God is trying to get us to understand that our self-love, our self-respect, you can't do it, amen, when you're in the middle of failure. The other thing is, we don't expect God to love us in the middle of our failure. Grace is always a surprise. We're programmed for reciprocity. We're programmed for behavior and punishment. So when somebody withholds judgment, especially when we deserve it, we're surprised. Angie, I want you to be surprised today. I want all of us to be surprised today by God's favor, by God's love, by God's forgiveness when we don't deserve it. None of us deserve it. That's what makes it grace. That's what makes it God. The law is the first word. That's religion. That's ex expectation. What, we, what, 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 what is demanded of us. But grace is the last word. The law exposes us. Moral values and, and expectations. We're exposed by those things. 
We're exposed to be failures. We're exposed to be bad. We're exposed to be messed up. But grace exonerates us. God has exonerated you. The law diagnoses, looks for reasons, looks for whys. But grace delivers. The law accuses. But grace acquits. The law condemns the best of us. But grace saves the worst of us. The law says cursed, but grace says blessed. The law says slave, grace says son. The law says guilty, and grace says forgiven. I, I want you to think about this. Look at the choices that Jesus made for his disciples. Think about you, Angie. Think about each of us. Think about ourselves. Think about your sons. When you look at the people that Jesus chose to be his followers, to be his disciples, they were the complete opposite of what we would think the qualifications for those jobs would be. Okay, can I ask you If you if you bear with me, Angie, I'm going to try to show you where your sons are, and where you can expect to be one day, where all of us believe God wants us to be. Amen. Just trust me, okay? Just be patient. Here's here's an example of a person that Jesus chose. Jesus chose this person. Uh, Luke chapter five. Verses 27 through 32. This is Levi, who's later called Matthew. He's a tax collector. He's hated by everybody. The whole community, his neighbors, everybody despises the guy. Therefore, being... Okay, Luke 5, 27 to 32. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican. A publican is just a sinner. A publican is just a... Average, no good. Amen? His name was Levi. And he was sitting at receipt of custom, and he said unto him, Follow me. He's a tax collector. Amen? And he left all and rose up and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. There was a great company of publicans, more sinners, and others that sat down with them. But there's the scribes, these religious people, and the Pharisees, they murmured against these people that Jesus had chosen saying, why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, they that are whole don't need a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to change their mind. To change their mind about what? About God. Praise the Lord. Now, Jesus turns everything upside down. And he's wanting to do that in your life right now, Angie, in all of our lives for that matter. Our whole ideas of what God is like, who God is, how does God respond to my behaviors, my long-term rejections, and, and so on and so forth. But Jesus turns everything upside down when it comes to what we think about God. And what we think is good. Here's a tax collector. They were not respectable people. They were hated. They were traitors. They were enemies of their own people. They were like loan sharks. They were like mobsters. That's what they were. They, they were uh, extortionists. They were despised. But here Jesus interrupts one of these people at his office, at the place where he's doing his dirty work. And Jesus comes to him right there where he's at, right where he's doing this stuff, and he says, follow me. Come with me. 
And what's the response? Levi throws a party. Amen? He had the liquor, the food, the whole thing's going on here. Amen? This is, again, this is not a religious person. So he throws this party, and who does he invite? People just like him, because they're the only ones that will come. Right? Because they all dislike him, because he's a bad guy. But Jesus comes to the party, and so does a bunch of other quote-unquote sinners, bad people. Amen? But he invites them to a party, not to some holy ceremony. Not just some religious activity, but a party. And he doesn't throw a party for the righteous people, but he throws a get-together for a bunch of scoundrels just like him in his house. And the scribes and the Pharisees object, naturally. So look at Luke chapter 5, verse 30. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples. <laughs> these guys drinking, these guys that are scoundrels, these guys that are sinners, these guys that are despised by all the religious people. Amen. The, 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 the Pharisees, the religious people, were murmuring against it, and they're saying, How come you're eating with publicans and sinners? The religious people are asking Jesus, How come you're partying with these bad people. And Jesus' response is his mission statement. He's speaking to the Pharisees, and he says, those who are well, or who think they are, like you guys, like you Pharisees, have no need of a physician, which is what I am. But those guys in their partying whom I'm with, know they need a physician. I haven't come to call the righteous. I haven't come to call those who think they got it all together, who think that they are good people and perfect and accepted. But I've come to call sinners. Like these guys know they are. And I've called them to change their mind about how God thinks of them. Jesus didn't just talk the talk. Jesus walked the walk. Not one of the original 12 disciples was a religious person. Jesus was interested in those who couldn't bring anything to the table. He wasn't interested in those who thought they could on their own. Jesus knew that the only people, only those who who didn't have anything going for him, could accept this one-way transaction. This just God doing everything. Just God loving. Just God forgiving. I mean, you only go to the doctor if you think you're sick. Right? You don't go to the doctor when you feel great, but when you suspect there's something wrong, you go to the doctor. Angie. Thanks for coming. The doctor's in. Hallelujah. Amen. That's why we're all here. That's why every one of us come. Okay, Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. And when they had this done, Praise the Lord, hallelujah. For when we were yet without strength, that's us, in due time, eventually Jesus came and died for who? The ungodly. That's the Bible speaking. The ungodly, not just people that are going through a bad time. Not just people that are down on their luck. Not just even people that are broken hearted and suffering. But to the perpetrators themselves. Yes. Hear me. The tax collectors, the prostitutes, the murderers, the adulterers. Yes. 
That's who Jesus came for. Your sons were at the top of the list, the priority of God. All of us are. Because we are all murderers in our heart. We're all adulterers in our own heart. We're all thieves and liars and robbers in our own heart. Just because we're not actually maybe doing it doesn't make us guilt, not guilty before the, the law. Because we want to do it and don't do it just because we're afraid of the consequences doesn't make us righteous. We are only righteous because of Jesus. It's not just theoretical sinners that Jesus comes for, but actual flesh and blood repeat offenders like me, like you, like everybody. And that's great when it's directed to the me. It's great when that grace and that love is directed towards me. But it's kind of like the Pharisees. Many, many Christians don't like it when grace is directed to our enemies. We want it because we need it and we know we need it. But it irritates us when God reaches out to somebody that we think doesn't deserve it because they've been bad because they did a horrible thing, because they, they took a moment in their life and screwed things up. Talk about repeat offenders. Take Peter. Peter, the so-called rock. Except for Peter being the first to acknowledge that Jesus was the Christ, Almost everything he did in the Gospels ended in correction, rebuke, or just simple failure. Jesus calls him a rock. Why? You know, some people wake up on third base and they think they hit a triple. You know what I'm saying? You didn't do anything, you just woke up there. It's just God's goodness that puts us there. And that's what happens so often with religious people. We wake up in a situation think we had something to do with it. Here I am. I'm, I hit a triple. I'm on third base. No, you didn't, idiot. You just woke up. I put you on third base. Right? Hallelujah. Jesus calls Peter a rock. And that's because Jesus had a foundational revelation, a basic truth that Jesus is the Messiah, that He is the Savior, that He has come, amen, to reveal God. So it's no coincidence that Peter was both the weakest, and I didn't, I'm not taking the time to go through all of his failures, but he had plenty. He was both the weakest and the one who recognized the Savior. And it's not a coincidence. Because he knew how much he needed a Savior. Like all of us, Angie. You've got great revelation. And you're here today to express it. You're saying, I know there's a God. I know there's a Savior. I know there's, I know there's answers. And he has them. Peter's faith was directly tied to his failings. Think about it. Your expressions today is, yeah, you're, you, you feel like, oh, I'm a failure. I, I, everything's wrong here. But your failure is the greatest expression of your faith. The fact that you're here and believing for God, even though you feel like a complete failure. Everybody's there. Everybody goes through those things. Everybody has issues. You know, we, we major on the drinking or we major on the uh, other ways that we try to deal with our failures or our self-image of being a failure. God's not put off by it. He's not freaked out by it. He came right to the place where they were having the party. He went right to where they were dealing with their pain and their hurt and their insecurity and sat down with them in the middle of it. 
He's not freaked out by our humanity. We are. Religious people are. He's not. John 21, and I'm going to read several scriptures here, so Sheila, if you can, John 21, we'll read verses 4 through 14. Now, this is after the resurrection. Jesus has already been crucified. Everything that's happened has already uh, transpired. He was put in the grave three days later. Now he has resurrected. Amen? When the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples didn't know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have you got anything to eat? Amen? And they said no. Cast your nets on the right side of the ship, and you'll find some. So they cast there, and now they were not able to draw in because of the multitude of the fishes. They'd been fishing all night, hadn't caught anything. Jesus just tells them where to fish, and immediately they have so many fish they can't even pull the net in. Amen? Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, said to Peter, it's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and he did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and a fish laid thereon and bread. So they got a fish barbecue going. Jesus said unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of great fishes, and 150 and three. For all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus said unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples asked him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Amen. So Jesus, I want you to look how he addresses his unbelieving disciples. Those who had deserted him at the time he needed him most. Those who had such a problem believing that he had been risen from the dead. He calls them children. He's calling you his child. Your sons. The disciples had every reason to expect punishment because they had failed in every possible way. And if you believe that Jesus loves and blesses only good people, those who are faithful, those who never deny Him, those who don't bail out when they're going through a trial, only those who always trust Him and obey Him, then you're going to have a hard time explaining to me Jesus the short order cook. Amen. John chapter 21, again, verses 15 through 17. I hope you're hearing this here, Angie. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love you. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Peter kept saying what he felt like Jesus didn't know. Jesus said, do you love me? Yes, I love you. His love was not perfect because he's a human being, but he did love the Lord in spite of all of his failure, in spite of denying the Lord three times, in spite of trying to kill one of the people that came after Jesus when Jesus said, put away your sword after he cut the guy's ear off. Saul who later becomes Paul, is a murderer. Not just a murderer, but a murderer of special people. 
a murderer of us, a murderer of Christians. Amen? And yet God chooses this guy, this murderer, to be the apostle of apostles. Amen? Peter was an utter failure. Peter, a complete failure on every level. But Jesus commissioned and used him anyway. Why? Because the success of the church doesn't rest on Peter's ability or yours or mine. It wasn't based on Peter's track record. The success of the church isn't based on my track record or your track record. It's not even based on Peter's love for Jesus. Any more than it's based on my love for Jesus. Because as human beings, our love rises and falls with circumstances and situations and so forth. God is love. And He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Jesus didn't need Peter any more than God needed Jonah. Jesus, His love and His grace restores Peter for Peter's sake. Not for God. Not for anybody else to judge. He restores Peter because He loves Peter. God wants to restore you because He loves you. Not based on what you do, but based on who He is. Peter is a failure. You couldn't find a bigger flop. I'm talking about in the, in the Gospels. And yet God loved him anyway. And he goes out of his way to tell us Christ died for the ungodly. He died for the sinners. And Jesus, he met Peter's failure head on. And he restored and commissioned him three times to prove to him that his failure was not greater than God's love. That his own opinion of himself had nothing to do with God's great love for him. Amen. Remember now, it's Jesus that's doing the feeding here, not Peter. Amen. Peter spent all night fishing. How'd that work out? He worked his tail off trying to get what he was unable to get. So then Jesus tells them where to cast the nets. And then he feeds them. Now how could, how could Simon, you know? He says, feed my sheep. Now how's Simon going to feed the sheep? Only because Jesus had all of the feeding under his control. So what qualifies us for acceptance with God? I can tell you. It's God's devotion to us. It's as plain as I can say it. The value of our lives, your son's lives, my children's lives, my grandchildren, the value of those lives rests in God's infinite, incomprehensible, unconditional love for us. Yes. Not in our love for Him. Right. Alright, Colossians chapter 2 verses 13 through 19. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath He quickened together with Him having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them, openly triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you 
in meat or in drink or in respect of a holiday or holy day or of the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man cheat you or, or deceive you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head, which is Jesus, from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment and ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Now, I'm going to just say this. If your sons were believers, they are with the Lord. The one who's deceased is with God right now, and the one who is, I suspect, in prison will be with the Lord. And so will you. You say you're, 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 giving, them, uh, you know, you're giving them a free ride. No, I'm telling you what God said. It isn't based on the fact that they did something evil in a moment. It's what Jesus did for an eternity that has made them accepted in the Beloved. I preached a message here a few weeks ago about Jeffrey Dahmer, a cannibal. Oh, yeah. And if he believed, as they claimed that he did, he's in heaven right now, as despicable, as hideous, as horrible as his crimes were. God goes out of his way to try to show us, I didn't come here for all these goody-goody people who think they got it all together. I came here for the ones who are down and out and have said, there's nothing left for me but you, Lord. If you're not real, there's nothing more for me. But if you are, you can take the most horrible situation, the most vile circumstance, and turn it in to praise for God. We have this, this mistaken idea that people that do bad things will never be with the Lord. If that were true, then the disciples aren't going to be there. And hardly anybody else that the Bible characterizes as believers in God would make it based on what they've done. And when you read the book of faith, you only see that God, the only evidence that God records is their faith. Now, I don't know what all is going through your mind and heart. I thank God I don't know because I've never been through it. But I'll say this, Angie. God sees you perfect and righteous and pure and holy in Him. And you can rehearse all of the failures, all the mistakes that you've made throughout your life, and God knows we've all got plenty of them. I could go on for hours just telling you about my own personal failures. Oh, sister, you don't know Nathan. You just know me now because I'm up here preaching, but I'm telling you, I lived a lifetime in sin. And if it were dependent on me to this day to be acceptable to God based on my behavior, I'd still come short. Because His bar is perfection. And that's why Jesus came. To be our perfection. So that God can look at you and say, this is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Because it's not based on what you do, it's based on who you are. When you got born again, your outward person didn't change. What changed was your spirit. It was born again. It was made alive to God. That's true of your sons. And if they were believers, and I'll stand before God with this, if they were believers, they are with the Lord today. Because it's not based on what we do in this life that gets us to heaven or gets us acceptance with God. It's what Jesus did in this life that has made us acceptable to God. Yes.
but you're still here. And God is still with you. And God has accepted you and your love as though it were perfect. How many times in our lives do we do something in a split second that could have led to similar kind of circumstances? And if you think about it, Jesus said, if you just say to your brother, I hate you, you're guilty of murder as far as the law is concerned. So there's people murdering every day in, in the eyes of God in terms of perfection that never come to trial. But they've already been judged by the standard of God's law. And that's why Jesus said, greater love has no man than he would give his life for his enemies, not for his friends, but for those who don't care. So I can say, I can tell you, this doesn't take a scholar. God's love for your sons supersedes any momentary action or even a lifelong activity of bad behavior. It's still covered by the blood of Jesus. If it isn't, we're all in serious, serious trouble. If his sacrifice isn't sufficient for everybody, it's not sufficient for anybody. And this whole scripture is talking about Failures, losers, and that's how we all feel at times. Yours is an extreme situation, no doubt, and I sympathize. But we all feel like the same thing. We all feel like we have failed. We failed our family. We didn't do enough for here. We, if we'd have just been better about this, they wouldn't be going through some of the things they're going through now. If we'd have been more consistent, if we'd have been this or if we'd have been that. But Jesus paid the price. The, the problem is there are consequences to behavior but not judgment from God. In other words, if, if I run out here and rob a liquor store and, and, and I get busted, I can't say that's God's judgment. God loves me the same before I rob the liquor store as he does after. The difference is the man got me because there's a law that says I can't do that and get away with it. That's not God's judgment. That's just the law. And so we look at a situation like this with your sons, and by no means do we condone it any more than we would in our own families, but we understand it. And how much more does God, who loved those two boys, believe it or not, more than you can ever imagine. As much as you love them, God's love is greater. You feel like you're dying in this situ because of this situation. I'm telling you, Angie, Jesus already died for this situation. So that you can live through it. So that you can experience more love, greater love. And you can share that with your son who's alive. And that his crime against his brother is understood by God. It's not, it's not a pat on the back. It's not saying good job. It's just saying God has forgiven you if you can accept it. His life is not over because he killed his brother and now he's in jail. The life that he knew is over, but his eternal life will go on as though nothing had ever happened. In heaven, he won't be running around with a sign on his back that says, oh, this guy squeaked in, he killed his brother. No. Any more than it would be there for Abraham with a sign on his back. Here's Father Abraham who pimped his wife. I mean, I'm just saying, not to be crude, I'm just saying we, we have missed the real depth and truth of the gospel. The gospel is God's love for sinners. And that love doesn't stop when we get saved. Because we still sin. But we are accepted in the blood. As though we knew no sin. Because he who knew no sin became sin for us who did nothing but sin. So that we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. It's a big thing to get your mind around and your heart around today, but I really believe that God's trying to, trying to share something with you, Angie, that you have you wanted, you hoped for, but couldn't believe that it would be possible. But I'm telling you, with Jesus, if those boys were believers, I'm not talking about being religious people that went to church every Sunday and never did anything wrong, but believers, that Jesus Christ was the Savior then they, you have every reason to believe that through eternity you're going to be with those boys. And one of them's already with Jesus, enjoying the love of a father. He's not lonely and hurting and, mis 
and in misery because he's not here with y'all. We're hurting. You're hurting because he's not here with you. But he's in a far better place. He wouldn't come back for anything. And you have that same thing to look forward to, and so does your other son. There's consequences, and he'll, he'll pay a price. But it won't be an eternal price because Jesus was the only one able to pay the eternal cost of sin. And he did it. And he did it just fine. He did it good. He did a good job. And he's trying to give you hope this morning that yes, life will not be the same in this world. But it doesn't have to be over. Jesus still wants to bless you and to walk with you and to heal your heart and your body. He wants to give you the best that He can give you that you are willing to accept in this life. Just as a down payment on what you've got coming in the next life. And that's true for your sons. It's true for both of those boys. Because in Jesus... The ultimate demand has been met. The deepest judgment has been satisfied. How can there be anything that God hasn't forgiven if we will believe it? We don't have to live any longer under the burden of trying to appease the judgment that we feel we deserve. Stop it! The judgment we feel is just that. A feeling. Not reality. The reality is, in spite of what I'm feeling, God has accepted me. God loves me. God has forgiven me. God has done everything within His power, ultimate, all power, to give me a hope and a life and a future. This is good news. In fact, it's the best news. The sins that I cannot forget, God can't remember. We believe it or we don't believe it. If you believe the gospel, if you believe the good news of Jesus, those things you can't get out of your heart, out of your mind, God doesn't even know they exist. He's cast it as far as the east is from the west. There is no remembrance of our failures and our sins with God. The things that we struggle with the most, God doesn't even know what we're talking about. He just sees a beautiful daughter and sons in whom He said, I am well pleased because of Jesus. I know it's it's insane from a natural perspective. It makes no sense in the natural. That's why we have to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Because your mind will lead you into all sorts of stuff that says, I can't do this. I I can't worship. My worship is so flawed and so messed up that God won't accept it. That's a lie of the devil. God sees you as perfect in Him. And your worship is like a sweet aroma, a fragrance, a perfume that comes up before God. And He's saying, thank you, Angie. Thank you, I appreciate that. Amen. Amen. That makes me feel good that my children love me Amen. and praise me. Thank you for trusting me, Angie, when everything in the world told you, just forget about it and give up. There's nothing more you can do. You can be the greatest testimony for Jesus Christ yes. by just believing in His love yes. and accepting that forgiveness and love yes. for yourself and your sons. Most people never get an opportunity. Most would never want to take the opportunity. But some people do. And it shows a great trust that God has for you. A confidence that God has that this gal can make it. She may not believe it today. She may not think she can make it today. But she will. And she'll give the glory to me. She'll praise me for the rest of her life, for what I'm doing in her life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's let's wrap this up. Colossians chapter 3, and we'll just read verses 1 through 4. Then I'd like the worship team, if you'll come up. Let's, uh, 
Let's just worship the Lord and thank him for what he's doing in Angie's life and in all of our lives and believe that this is a breakthrough moment, an opportunity for God to be more real than he's ever been in our lives. Amen. Praise the Lord. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God to the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Praise the Lord. Let's try Colossians chapter 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Praise the Lord. Now let me just close with this as the worship team comes. Is anything greater than God? No. Are my sins greater than God? No. My failures? No. My weaknesses? No. Nothing is greater than God. Amen. And this great God, who cannot be paralleled, who cannot be even attained to by the greatest of humanity, has accepted us as perfect in his eyes. With all of our flaws, with all of our failures, his love continues to reach to us, to embrace us, to soothe us, to comfort us, and to empower us to be more than we ever dreamed we could be because it isn't us, it's Christ in us. Let's worship the Lord now and just thank God. Just let the love of Christ pour over you and accept it. And believe that in the worst of situations, God's love is greater than the circumstance. You say, well, I, I don't know how anybody could relate to this. God can relate to it. He watched his own son die a horrible death by his brothers. He came to his own and his own received him not. In fact, his own murdered him. But God didn't stop reaching out for those murderers. He, in fact, took that death and applied it to their account so that they wouldn't be judged for the very murder that they had committed. So that they could know that God is a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of compassion. He's not angry. He's not judging. The only judgment that's going to come will be the judgment of those who have not believed in Him. Everyone else, the judgment's already fell. And it all fell on Jesus. All of his wrath was poured out on Jesus. That means there was none left over for your sons or for you or for me as believers. For God so loved that he gave. Let's thank him this morning. Praise the Lord.
There is no 